I love being in rural China. It's probably not the best business decision. So many people may say in English, it's spelled C-E-N-T-R-E. -E. What is a center? <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you an example, we had President Obama's daughters uh -huh. in her school. You know, they would come to, I have an education site in Shizhou, and they would spend four or five months in the village of Shizhou. We dedicate 50% of every one of our sites to common areas. So we try to encourage local villagers to come into our common areas so they can use our fitness centers, our libraries, everything, That's so nice. that it allows for interaction. Our goal was to really inject a new narrative, a more balanced, what we have felt, story to the Chinese story abroad. And what we felt that unfortunately the 99% of China was not being told. And so in some way, we wanted to add a voice to that storytelling. I have confidence in this country. The Chat Lounge. Chat Lounge. Chat Lounge. The Chat Lounge unpacks views and opinions on hot issues in a more casual way. Hello and welcome to The Chat Lounge. I'm Tu Yun. In this special episode, we talk to Brian Linden, founder of the Linden Center, also known as Xilin Yuan in Chinese a chain of boutique hotels converted from historic buildings in rural China. Born and raised in a blue-collar family in Chicago, Lyndon first came to China nearly 40 years ago as a language student. In his adult life, Brian followed a varied career path that included but not limited to leading actor in China's first movie to cast a foreigner, cameraman for CBN's Beijing Bureau. Stanford PhD candidate and education agent in East European countries. But eventually, he decided to come back to China to live and work in rural areas rather than in cities like many expats do. So what made him make such a choice? Brian, a warm welcome to you and uh, thanks for coming to the studio. So I understand you just came back to China after visiting uh, the Laos and Thailand. What's your mission there? I originally we went to Thailand and, and Laos really to look at potential projects. Mm -hmm. We feel that some of our preservation projects um, have been maybe increasingly successful and welcomed here in China. And we felt that perhaps along the high-speed train line, that maybe in the future there were things we could do to um, perhaps with the Chinese government or whatever to promote um, travel into China. Mm. As you said, um, at the invitation of the local government, what did they ask you to do there? No, in general, we went on a really on a personal visit. So oh, we went right. personally because we didn't want to commit to anything yet. Okay. So I felt that even though I had lived in Thailand in the early 1990s and have traveled to Laos many times, I really wanted to see how the high-speed train um, has been impact has impacted the country of Laos and the people and its people. Right. You may have told people many times um, about what brought you to China, but for those who don't know the story, would you please give them a, a brief introduction? Okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, the first time I came to China was 1984, mm -hmm. and I received a scholarship from the Chinese government to come here to study. So that was um, very unlikely because my background was not necessarily a very academic background. I was a community college student and really almost like a night school kid. Mm -hmm. um, I was a carpet cleaner, I was sold lady shoes, I did everything in Chicago. Um, and I really knew nothing about China. But China gave me an opportunity. Um, they felt that I probably was the one who could benefit most from this scholarship. So I accepted the scholarship and in 1984 moved to China. Um, my whole life changed then. And really the story ever since has been our efforts to show, demonstrate some gratitude mm. toward the country for giving, taking a chance on me. And then also for the really the, the nonstop respect and support we get here in China. Mm. 
I feel that that's something that often goes overlooked by some foreigners, is this idea of um, mm. you know, that kind of this kind of idea of taking care of those who come to China. I feel that I have benefited so much from that. And in many ways, our future project, which, beca- which became Ximi Yuan, mm. the Linden Center, um, really is a result of this early exchange, uh, this inner in exchange with China. Right. And before choosing to um, move back to China in 2004, is that right? Yeah, 2004. Right. You had worked and lived in other um, countries in Europe and Southeast Asia yeah, as well? Yeah, in South America. Um, then what made you decide that China is the place you want to maybe spend the rest of your life? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. Um, the first reason is that initial scholarship. Um, China gave took a chance on me. Mm. I really didn't deserve that chance. And China gave me that opportunity. I was not the probably the ideal recipient of that of that scholarship. Mm. Um, the second day I was in Beijing in 1984, in on August 30th, I suddenly was recruited by um, the Beijing Film Studio to start filming a movie, to be a leading actor in a movie. Mm -hmm. I spoke not a single word of Chinese, and suddenly I'm acting in a in a movie. Um, later CBS News came and interviewed me and they asked me if I would be willing to join their team. Mm. So I went from somebody who really didn't have a clear future and probably not a very positive future in America Mm -hmm. to somebody that who suddenly had all these opportunities in life because of the chances that China was taking on me. And, um, you know, I'm forever grateful to those Mm. initial opportunities. Mm. In China, you lived in many Big cities uh, like um, Beijing and uh, Nanjing and uh, traveled to many places around the country. So why did you eventually choose to settle down in a rural village instead of some, um, you know, first tier cities like um, most expats do in China? There are a number of reasons for that. Um, One, in the 1980s, I was able to travel to every province. I found that I was challenged and also really... Um, I, I attracted by China's rural areas. Mm. Um, the people, you know, just to me were so charming. And so I ended up traveling to every province and, um, in the 1980s. Um, throughout my time in China, I've spent over 200 nights on um, trains mm. in China. So you can imagine how far I could go right. on 225 nights, 250 nights. But you know, my, our goal was the idea. Our goal was to really inject a new narrative, a more balanced what we have felt um, story to the Chinese story abroad. Mm-hmm. We felt that many foreigners were receiving information about China, while not not the the, the information was not necessarily invalid. But it would just represent a small part of China, mm-hmm. and what we felt that unfortunately the ninety nine percent of China was not being told. And so in some way, we wanted to add a voice to that storytelling. Mm. And we can do that in many ways. You know, if we're if we join the media, we often are answering to those above us. So the companies have their own business, business, you know, um, needs and missions. But in some way, I wanted to tell a story that really shared what I felt was not uh, was the authentic China mm. was the story of the common people, and I felt that that was easier to share if I were myself um, based in a more rural area. Mm. If I were to be based in San Litun, um, it's harder to feel maybe that four thousand nine hundred and seventy year Chinese history. You can feel the thirty year, the recent thirty years of Chinese history. But I really wanted to take that earlier 4,970 years mm. and somehow add it, you know, inject it into the storytelling of the, and the observations right. I had in China. So that's why we chose a rural area over a, a more maybe for a Western person, a more comfortable and safe, you know, kind of urban mm. destination. Then wouldn't it make your days in China more difficult given, you know, uh, the poor quality of the medical and um, health infrastructure and insufficient 
cultural facilities. I bet you've experienced a lot of hardships during your、uh, travel around China. Yeah, but、uh, I mean, maybe from some people's viewpoints, they would view them as hardships, whereas、mm. I felt they were just、um, really exciting aspects of the journey. Um, I was not when I wherever my whole life has been a life not of seeking comfort.、Mm. Um, I've traveled to 110 countries. I've never been to a beach resort. I've never pursued that kind of travel.、Mm. To me, travel is challenge is a challenge, and I did not want to just seek comfort and safety.、Mm. My family's life. I am lucky that I have had a wife. Who has been willing to risk as much as I have,、mm-hmm. and that my two children have adapted to a life that is far from conventional, and I think that the probably the only reason we are continu- able to do this is because we feel in China there is this sense that you will never let us fail, that we as foreigners, when we come to China, and foreigners, if we do have a certain respect and values. We find that often we're embraced by the Chinese people,、mm. and it gives us a confidence that I feel encourages us to take more risk. So, in many ways, if you evaluated, for example, the Linden Center, our new site, you know, our our kind of efforts at developing a social enterprise,、mm-hmm. um, the hotels we have.、Um, It was a risky venture. Right. We sold our house in America. We gave up our jobs. We brought over almost seven hundred thousand dollars, all our savings. And I come from a fairly poor background, so that was a lot, a lot of money. And then we homeschooled our children for eleven years. Those, to many people, would say those are risks.、Mm. I felt it was part of the joy of the of the journey, and this, to me, is something that I guess the way you evaluate life. Um, I have found that all of these risks or challenges、right. have been some of the most happy times of my life. Maybe you were born to be a challenge taker or an adventurer to some extent. I believe that maybe we were born to do that, but I believe that the most important thing is for many of us as foreigners here in China. Is I don't think we fully acknowledge sometimes、mm. how much you guys take care of us, you know, how much the extra sense of, you know, that we may not fail,、mm. you know,、um, that you probably won't let us fail, and that's if you had the right values and everything. And I believe that that was the case for us. How could the Yunnan government let us fail? When they saw me meeting with the leaders of the province or of the prefecture, and my two boys were with me at the meeting,、mm. they were five and eight years old, and we're homeschooling them. So I'm going to meet one of the leaders, and I have to first get my children's textbooks out, and、mm. they're in the meeting with me. They see those values, and they say, "How can we let this idealistic, this naive?" This also passionate person fail.、Mm, but when you met them for the first time, what kind of things would give you such big confidence? I'm just curious. I think that again, it's a sense that I, my life, and the person I have become was forged by those early experiences in China in the 1980s. Right. I was lucky enough to meet so many of China's leaders when I was with CBS News.、Mm. So many of China's cultural figures. It gave me a confidence that I never had in life, so I carry that confidence and also that understanding of China.、Mm. So if I sit down with a leader and we can talk, I can talk to them about Wang Yangming,、mm. or I can talk to them about Zhu Xi or Chu Jiubai. They they are amazed. So for some reason, there's an immediate respect they show me, and this this is something that I feel. It's just natural. Why? Why? Why should I get respect for that? If you start talking to me about Ni Tai or something, I was like,、uh, uh, so what? But here in China, you're, you know, there's a sense of pride that maybe an outsider has taken his time and energy and made the effort、mm. to try to learn not just the language, but to learn who we are. And I feel that that gives.、Um, that's something that I feel a lot of foreigners don't necessarily acknowledge. That we as as visitors here、mm. are always being taken care of. Maybe it's just because of the the respect you have for each other. Right.、Mm. Exactly. You 
are listening to the Chat Lounge. We are talking to Brian Linden, founder of the Linden Center. Hotels converted from ancient buildings of ethnic groups. The first of which is of the Bai style in Shizhou, a town in the Dali Bai Autonomous Prefecture in northwestern Yunnan Province. In each of the communities, the buildings are more than just hotels.、Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Linden Center.、Um, the business, would you call it, or? Yeah, it's hard to describe. I mean, even after all these years, it's been eighteen years, right? Um, so many people may say in English it's spelled C C E N T R E.、Mm. What is a center? <laughs>、um, no, people know about this American center in a lot of countries, right? Maybe they would picture the Linden Center as the same thing, but、uh, essentially, it's a boutique、um, hotel in the、exactly. in the very beginning. In the beginning, the idea was that we wanted to create almost like a social enterprise.、Mm. Um, so, in a social enterprise, as a social entrepreneur, I believe that often, and I feel I'm very proud to be kind of more of a social entrepreneur.、Mm. I see maybe some challenges in society that、um, are not so easily addressed, perhaps through business, through an immediate business or or government, you know, kind of、um, action. And we try to make a, you know, kind of come up with a business model that somehow will allow us to address those issues.、Mm-hmm. For me, the the chushin, the beginning, the reason behind Xinyuan is really probably two or three. One is the most important is diplomacy. We really wanted to set up people to people diplomacy. We really wanted to be a base for that.、Mm. Um, I felt that the stories of you, of the people in China, were not being relayed, were、mm. not being told, maybe as effectively as as maybe we could. I know I can only make just a small. I'm a shell to do, you know. I'm a small potato, but I just felt that in some way I wanted to try. So we felt that in order to do that, we had to come up with a way to get people into these rural areas. We had to have a hotel, but that hotel was not really the end. Was not our end purpose.、Mm-hmm. It was a way of interacting with the local people. It was a way of doing more educational exchanges,、um, and that's really been the. The main purpose of the center ever since we were successful in the beginning as a hotel, and many people were willing to invest in us to just set up a hotel chain, and we refused taking on investors because, in some way, I felt that our social model was not so clear.、Mm. We needed to refine it. Then, can you、um, tell a little bit more specifically what people actually do? At the Linden Center, which is converted from a historic building,、yes. right? So the, our first, the way we, the way we demonstrated our commitment to the village and to the community and to China、mm. was first taking we took over an old building.、Um, the restoration of a heritage site usually is more expensive. It takes more time,、right. more headaches, much more complicated, and you usually can never inject the kind of luxury. Into the into the old building that will satisfy, kind of the high end, chi- tourists. You、mm. know, tourists are now looking. They're increasingly attracted by almost a design, sexy, sexy design.、Uh-huh. And when you have an old building, that's the design. It hasn't changed, and it's not going to change. It shouldn't change.、Mm. It represents our our inherited culture. And we felt that if if anything, we needed to be only curators or stewards of this culture. We did not need to change it.、Mm. So when when people come to the center, our goal is to try to give them、uh, comfortable, convenient、um, site, you know, a bed, a room, but then opportunities to really go out. And explore the surrounding areas.、Mm. Um, we dedicate fifty percent of every one of our sites to common areas, so we try to encourage local villagers to come into our common areas, so they can use our fitness centers, our libraries, everything.、That's、so、nice. that it allows for interaction,、mm. and then we host a lot of activities. Before Yiching, we were doing activities maybe three or four times a week. Um, before eating, before、oh, COVID. COVID, right? Yeah, before COVID. But now,、um, 
now we're going to slowly re you know slowly restore recover you know try to those kind of programming mm. programs but the goal was to develop kind of genuine authentic um interaction you know platforms between the local people the visitors mm -hmm. so the visitors were not so traveling solely for the size of their bedroom you know but they were coming to maybe be exposed and challenged and interact with a different culture. Mm. How many uh, tourists have you received so far? Oh, many, many. I don't, gosh. But I mean, and to be honest, during the summer, we had averaged probably five, six, seven hundred people a day coming into the center, mm. into one of our sites. You know, we now have six sites. Right. So they, um, yeah, they come in and they want to, they, they're really proud of our story. Mm. Um, my time is really dedicated to interacting with those visitors. It doesn't matter if you are a, a staying guest or if you are just walking in. We will pro we will usually come out and try to greet you and spend time with you and take photos with you. Right. Um, yeah. So so I try to focus quite a bit on the guest relations. Mm. Looking back, what was the biggest challenge uh, in the entire process of uh, you know transforming? this historic building into um, what is it is now today you know it's interesting that i don't feel there were any real large problems uh. to i believe that again this harkens back to heart to what we were saying you know about china is mm. the in many ways our mission was viewed by most people as being very very good and at the time and even right now there are very few businesses that are willing to take on the challenges of, you know, of transforming a heritage building because they know even if they do everything right, mm. it still is going to be not as comfortable, perhaps, as a new, you know, steel and glass and cement building. So I feel that the, maybe the greatest challenge for us has been as China's hotel industry mm -hmm. has become increase, increasingly focused on design and luxury, um, the older buildings in China, to some people, are not as attractive. So that, to me, is a little bit sad. When we travel to Venice, when we travel to Paris, when we travel to, you know, Lima, we 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 are going there to stay in old. You know, we we're willing to stay there. When you're in Paris, you're staying in an old building. You know, and it's a five-star hotel. It's not necessarily a, you know, really luxurious five-star hotel, mm. but it's giving you a Paris experience. And um, what I feel is somehow we should be sharing China experience, not just a five-star hotel experience mm. that we can have anywhere. And so this is where I feel that that's been the biggest challenge for us is we have to increasingly inject a lot of passion, service, um, everything to ensure that our guests are happy because they may not immediately be content with the hardware mm. that these older buildings provide. Right, but there's always this uh, dilemma, right, given China's um, urbanization drive uh, in the country. People always want something new. Yes, but this is something that I feel that maybe Maybe we have to, the base, of, to me, I feel the foundation of China's soft power mm. is, um, has to be connected in some way also with the old. Right. I mean, soft power is a reflection of your cultural, the strength of your culture. Um, I really hope that in some way we take increasingly, you know, grow, we increasingly have pride mm -hmm. in what was handed down to us. Sure. So much of our built heritage in China has we have lost it over the years mm. and um, what I feel what that the remaining built heritage should remain and should be protected mm. and should be there to tell stories and provide a connection between modern China and where we came from right well so there was never a moment uh, when you felt like giving up or or even leaving China not no that never so i mean we never would think that that's um 
But that again is tied to the gratitude I have mm. toward China since that not early since receiving that early scholarship. You know, everything that I'm doing here in English in America, we have a saying. Sometimes it's like the icing on the cake,、mm. which you know sometimes means, you know, man, my life is already wonderful. But then everything that everything now is just like an extra added layer of sweetness、right. on top. And whenever I have challenges, I just look at it that way: is to say, I shouldn't even be here. I should never have been here, you know. But somebody has been looking out for me,、mm-hmm. and、um, and China has given me opportunities that really I, I probably I didn't deserve in the beginning. I hope that I'm slowly earning that, the, you know, earning the respect now from from China. You're listening to the Chat Lounge. We'll be back after this. Dunhuang, situated along the ancient Silk Road, where fine arts and divine beliefs merged with the natural world. It's where the East and West interacted, and where the world's largest Buddhist art gallery still fascinates and amazes people today. A place where stories of life and death, love and hatred, passion and desire. Faith and sacrifice have been generated and told for two thousand years. Buckle up for our new podcast, Why We Love Dunhuang, the one and only podcast that can take you to the fantasy world of Dunhuang and beyond through our audio tour. Listen and subscribe for free on major podcast platforms. Why we love Dunhuang? You will have your answers. Welcome back. You are listening to the Chat Lounge. We are talking to Brian Linden, founder of the Linden Center. The Linden Center has now developed into a heritage hotel chain already. So, h- how many venues do you have now? You know, we have sites in. We have three sites in in the Dali, Shijo,、mm. and then we have、uh, two sites now up on the mountain in Shibaljan, in Shashi, all in Yunnan. Yes, and then one in Suzhou. All right, beautiful one in Suzhou.、Mm, and we are currently、Superant. working on projects in Nujiang, and also in Shangli La. Right, beautiful places. Yes, but、uh, you said they are usually located in places not so commercialized, right? And、uh, very <laughs> close to, or right in the villages where ethnic minorities live together.、So、why? It's my own personal interest as well. It's not a good. It's probably not the best business decision. No, I don't think there、People、are other too many of our competitors are knocking on the door waiting for. Right. But but I do believe it's a reflection of my passion, and my interest, my passion for and interest in the, in the Chinese people.、Mm. Um, I love being in rural China. You know. But have you ever met anybody questioning your、uh, motivation? Sure. I mean, I'm sure there there are a lot of people who question my motivation, and both some some within China, perhaps, but then、mm. also some outside of China.、Mm. What you did know? they say? Oh well, they say. Well, I mean, in reality, they will say that maybe the idea of coming, you know, that we are maybe damaging or leading to more tourism development, where maybe that shouldn't occur. Because especially when we choose smaller places, right?、Mm. That may so a place like Shijou, you know, eighteen years ago really didn't have develop, wasn't really tourist, you know, focus. Yeah. Now it's become very, very hot, very,、mm. very de- nice destination. Very popular. Some people will say, "Oh, well, Shenyuan kind of helped to inspire that."、Um, to in some people's eyes, we should be proud of that. In others, they will say you should be disappointed. Because you kind of maybe destroyed, maybe you led to some you know effect on the local people's lives.、Mm. So that's always going to be a difficult balance. Right. You know, I studied economics at Stanford, and I mean, I understand this balance. Right.、Um, I'm very much. I'm a very aware of it. So I understand those criticisms.、Um, so. Yeah. In Chinese philosophy, we also、um, stress a lot on、um, balance. Right. Yes. Yes. Then how? Did you manage to hit the balance? Well, I don't know if we've been successful in achieving a balance, but I would say that our mission, our values, have really never changed. Right.、Um, we continue to focus on the social aspects around us.、Um, my wife is not here with me right now, mainly、mm. because we have the new 
a new library that we helped develop in a mm. small village of 600 people up on right. the mountain. So we are trying to do things wherever we have a footprint, wherever we have a site. We are trying to ensure that hopefully most of the benefits will go to the local people and not solely to maybe my investors, right. you know, if I'm a bigger company. Um, I don't have a luxury car. Mm. I don't have a luxury watch. To me, those things are very, very are unimportant. So my greatest joy comes from the fact that maybe I am trying to, you know, achieve a balance that is helping those around me as much as helping myself. That's good. And in an interview, you said you wanted to make the center 24-7 Davos. Has that goal been achieved? And how has that goal come in line with the purpose of um, maintaining local traditional customs? Originally, we wanted to do that mainly because of the, our, our ideas of diplomacy. Mm. We really wanted to get educated, both um, foreigners and at some educated urban-based Chinese, right. away from Haigian, away from the kind of those areas where the classrooms provide us an incredible space for interaction. But often when we leave the classrooms, we all go to Starbucks and hang out and interact. And what we wanted somehow was I wanted to challenge those people. When they left their classroom, say in Yunnan, they would immediately be immersed in a different culture and something that would also be a learning experience for them. Right. So this is why we wanted to move those kind of talks into a place, to a place like right. Xili Yuan. Um, that's something that we continue with, you know, we would like to do, but because of COVID, mm. we have held back a little bit on those kind of plans. We do a lot of programming. We do a lot of programming, but um, yeah, that, um, you know, we hope that in, in the coming years that we'll be able to kind of restore some of those initial mm. initial programs. So, so far, the biggest challenge you've encountered on uh, toward that purpose is the pandemic. Is the pandemic. Right. Before, before the pandemic, I mean, just to give you an example, we had President Obama's daughters uh -huh. in her school. You know, they would come to, I have an education site in, edu in Shijo. And they would spend five months, four or five months in the village of Shizhou. And we would turn Dali, we would turn Sangshan Arhai, we would turn the resources of the region into their curriculum. Right. So this is a, these are American le America's leaders, American leaders' children. And they will come. And um, our goal was to give future American leaders and exposure, we have to allow them to understand a, a China and understand not just the Haidian to China, but mm. also something different. And I think it, it's very effective. Many of those students, you know, will go on to be America's future, you know, very influential people in business and politics and culture. And they will always carry that five month experience in China mm. with them. And um, they will always have an emotional connection to China. Right. Then you said that you have a great passion for China's rural areas. And after staying um, there for two decades almost, yeah. what would be your advice on China's uh, rural revitalization? You know that this country yes. has uh, some strategy on revitalizing rural areas. I believe that maybe what we lack the most in the mm. rural areas is um, really kind of a long-term commitment of people, outsiders coming in or returning. One thing in China, because in rural areas, it's very hard for us to secure a home. Mm. You know what I mean? To secure a base. So not to foreigners, but Chinese as well, as you know. Um, it means that in many ways, we will always view our experience in the village as being probably nomadic, you know, transit it's just like almost you'll be it will be transitory it will be kind of nomadic you probably won't stay i i wish somehow we could encourage or come up with a way to allow you know outsiders to come in and really live and really grow with the community mm. um have their children go to school there um this is something that happens around the world mm. This is, you know, but not in China. No, mm. and this is what some, has been 
preventing it from do uh, people from doing so. I think it's again the property, the property that ideas, you know, some of the regulations. Um, as as an outsider, we can't, you know, you can't go to Shizhou and buy a house. Mm, you um, can't go and buy a courtyard, and you can't then say, oh, I'm going to have my children go to local school. Yeah. And this is something that I feel you will never have a true commitment to the local community mm -hmm. if all you're doing is going there and renting, you know, a, a little a few few rooms for five years. You're not going to invest in the building. You're not going to upgrade it. You're not going to probably move your whole family down there. You're going to keep your children here in Shanghai or Beijing so that they go to the best schools. So what is happening is there's never a real commitment mm. from us who are from outsiders. We always know that we probably are going to leave. So that to me means that often, for example, Xi Yuan, we have very, very good mission mm. and values. We want to contribute. But if you don't have those values, really you're there just for an experience. Right. And it's usually probably a pretty personal experience of self-discovery. Mm -hmm. That does not necessarily mean that you are going to be involved in the community, that you're going to help the community in any way. And these are issues that I think are very, very challenging. Mm, but have you noticed any um, changes or sign of changes over the past, like a few years? Because government is actually encouraging people, you know, to do some work or go back to villages and to you know construct the countryside yeah i haven't noticed it yeah um i think that right now the structure of where the best schools and the best hospitals and everything are in the big cities mm. um, will always mean for those who are not adventurous and rich risk-taking they will always probably find comfort and mm. security in and you know where they where they've come from and so it does take a little bit of it really needs you need risk takers right but the risk takers need to also have some benef potential benefit and if you're going to risk take only for a five-year lease on a whole on a little guest room where you really don't have you know you're going to you need to invest money to change it and you will never get that money back i don't think that's really enticing you know to most to most risk takers you're listening to the chat lounge we are talking to brian linden an american expat who helps revitalize historic buildings in rural china by transforming them into hotels recreational and cultural exchange centers for visitors not long ago linden published a book in chinese about his decades-long experiences in china he calls the book a love letter to china so let's um Turn to your, your book. You've published a book titled Redefining Diplomacy, A Village at a Time, um, telling people <laughs> about... Xunjiang Zhongguo, yeah. Right, <laughs> in Chinese. Uh, telling people about the cause of you coming to China and what you've experienced since uh, you first arrived in mm -hmm. Beijing in 1984. So why did you decide to write and publish such a book nearly 40 years later? Why not earlier? So writing a book often is a, what I feel is a pretty lonely experience. You mm. have to isolate yourself um, from those around, surround, you know, around you. And I found that, um, you know, our, our original mission was really diplomacy. And I wanted to be with the people. I right. wanted to be out there. So before COVID, I really never had time to sit down and write anything. Oh. Um, I did want to share and I did want to do something. But um, in many ways, the book is almost like a, a love letter to China. Yeah. I just was in some ways saying, thank you for giving me this experience. And to the readers, what I really wanted to share was just real stories. Mm. I don't tell people what to think, you know. All I do is tell stories right. and um, share stories of my interactions with the common people, with the government, restoring buildings, our business experiences. And I, you guys, you know, whoever, the reader can then decide if they have any meaning, if they, what, you know, what I'm trying to say. And what I hope is it's just adding substance, some nuance to the views of China, you know, to those, to others who, from out, outside of China. And also to those in, you know, Chinese who maybe have never really interacted with foreigners who have had 
a long ex- interaction with this country and hear their views and what was interesting to them. Right. But besides telling people your story, what's happened uh, literally, I think you also questioned some uh, China experts from the West saying they, they wouldn't step out of their, you know, five-star comfort zone in big cities and cannot speak the language, but come up with uh, certain narr- narratives about China. Right. And you said their understanding about China is quite limited and uh, far from reality. And what's behind these phenomena? And how can you assure people that your narrative about China is balanced and is not short-sighted or superficial. In fact, you know, it's it's very hard. Mm. And um, it would be very easy to say my views of China to some of them would be say are not so important because really all I'm relaying are, are stories of, of common, common stories in mm. China. And many times the, um, the experts will be based in the seats of power and they will be sharing experiences that maybe have more political ramifications so they will be sharing ideas on those stories on those you know concepts Mm. are my my idea was that sometimes i feel that the the story of china being told is often as i said lacks some what we say in english is nuance and it's very easy to tell a story based on western views of china especially Mm. political views And we go into that story with that narrative and purpose. So we shape the story to really serve our our end goal. I really didn't, all I did was tell stories in this. And of course, I pick and I chose different stories. But the goal was not to pick and choose stories to tell a specific narrative. As you know, in the story, I talk about kind of in a way being kind of apprehended by the Guangzhou 18 times, you know, in the 1980s and stuff. <laughs> yeah, the police station. So I talk about all various sides. But um, but again, what my goal was just is to add some nuance. I have been in China off and on for 38 years, you know, every province. Mm-hmm. Um, met the Chinese leaders, everything. Um, I still don't feel I understand fully. And I would never be bold enough to tell the outside world that they should believe what I believe. So I never do that in my book. All I tell people is say, is say, this is an American whose life has changed because of his interaction with China. Mm. This is the way it has changed a bit. And these are some of the stories that led to that change. You can take these stories and read them and interpret them as you Mm. want. But I'm not telling them this is, this demonstrates, you know, China's a certain way, whatever. Since you mentioned your experience 18 times uh, being taken to the police station, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you said every time it came out to be something joyful or something that you really enjoyed. Yeah, I guess that maybe I'm always trying to, um, maybe I'm naive and, you know, but I'm always trying to look at the positive things. Um, when I cross the border, just even just, I'll give you an example, coming from Laos to, to China. Right. Um, there aren't many foreigners crossing the border right now, you know, so, so we had to go through a lot of security. And I had many of the, the guards with me asking me to wait. And we started talking. And I shared my book with them. I showed them my book. Mm. Suddenly, all the guards were around me and their leaders just talking, wanting to share, take photos. And it was just so charming. And I feel that in many ways, those early experiences, even though I was, I was wrong, I shouldn't have been in those places. Um, not because they were militarily sensitive, whatever. It's more because China, they had not been open officially to foreigners. And... Um, but in some way, the government, they, you know, the, the, the guards were very, very kind. <laughs> so, you know, sorry, God, you're not supposed to be here. Why mm. are you here? Come with us. And um, here, do you want to drink some tea, you know? And so they were never really mean or too angry. And um, I don't know if that has changed now. Um, many of my friends say that they feel China is becoming maybe increasingly less open to foreigners. <laughs> Um, maybe I, because of what they did maybe, in China. Exactly. Right. To be honest, I was on the. I arrived here in Beijing a few days ago. 
I was on the subway and suddenly the whole, all the people in the subway were talking with me. Uh. I don't think foreigners do that. I don't think foreigners do that. So Chinese are always open if you're willing to share. Of course. And it, this all started because I started talking in Chinese to a young child on the train. Mm. And suddenly they're all surrounding me. To want, so it's really fun. Right. So you've had a lot of, um, you know, praises for China. Some people would say it's because of those complimentary words about China that has helped you succeed in the country. Mm. And now that you have um, vested interests in, in China, of course, you have to speak for it. So what would you say to those people? You know, I would say that there, that there probably is some, some to, from some people's views, there's a valid point there. I am not doing it consciously. My views of China have never changed. Um, they are not being manipulated solely for business purposes. Our business, we could have grown at a much faster level and, uh, and become much larger, um, you know, a decade ago. So um, I understand that people may say that or some people may say that. Um, it is never meant to be. Um, I am not here to lie to anyone. Um, my wife and I, my children, we have spent our lives in China. And I do not see anything wrong with pointing out so many of the positive aspects we have experienced here. I think the outside world gets a little bit of the negative mm. aspects of China. They get that from a lot of different, you know, from media, whatever. Yeah. Um, maybe it's time to have some people share some of the positives. In America, we have soft power cover up some of our own problems. So maybe the aggressive, maybe a more aggressive military stance is often softened by Spider-Man, oh. by, you know, by right. Avatar, by, you know, McDonald's, by Starbucks, by Apple. China doesn't have that benefit yet. The outside world doesn't know enough about China to balance the negative stories coming out of the country sometimes. And this is something that I just wanted to try to do. Does Spider-Man any more valid than my stories in China? Mm -hmm. Does Spider-Man tell a true story about America? No. But it does talk about America's creativity, mm. which I agree is incredible. And I'm, but it doesn't mean that Spider-Man is America. It doesn't mean that Kobe represents all of America. And this is something that we need. We need more touch points with China. And I just felt that in some way, I wanted to share real stories to let people have a little bit of that kind of touch point. Yeah, it's quite a novel angle to explain it. So you said a reason for, for you to choose to live in China uh, was that you felt your mission here may have some impact on the world's most important geopolitical relationship, the Sino-US relations. Mm -hmm. So what impact do you mean, actually? And how optimistic are you about accomplishing the mission? Well, uh, based on the recent, uh, <laughs> um, I guess I haven't been so successful. Uh. But again, I'm a small potato. But what, what, I, what, it, what I represent is, I think, like many people, both Chinese and, and maybe Americans, if we speak about both of us, is there are both many people who really want to continue the friendship between our countries. Mm -hmm. And um, so many of us can then go pursue our lives and our families and, and professions and maybe never have an impact on that relationship. Right. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to try. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm a small potato. I'm, my impact is very, very small. But also, I think that I shouldn't shortchange under, you know, what I'm doing. Every day, sometimes, you know, every day we may speak to a thousand people. Right. Over a year, that's 365,000 face-to-face interactions in some way. That doesn't include media. That doesn't include all these things. So mm -hmm. maybe we have it, are having a little bit of an impact. I hope that my Chinese friends, when they see an American mm -hmm. doing what I'm doing, out of respect for their country, that they also will view America with different eyes, that they will realize there are many people in America who are similar to me. In fact, America is very open. And what I want to share is our openness with China and show them that while I'm an American, I'm also proud to be a part of China. Very proud. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I'm not American. 
but it just means that this is part of being American, maybe in my eyes, is sharing. Is I, I'm proud to represent America here in China in some way. It's supposed to be a long and tough journey. I think so, yes. Right. And given the worsening uh, Sino-U.S. relations, are you concerned that maybe one day um, you'll have to discontinue with what you are doing right now or even leave the country as what's been happening to, to some uh, Chinese working in the business or cultural exchange or, or scientific research fields in the States? It's, it's something that obviously we, we, we have to be concerned about. Um, it would happen probably with no regrets. Our life has, it's been a good journey. You know, my wife and I have had a wonderful experience here in China. Um, our lives have been really, really, we would have no regrets. Um, I'm slowly giving up more of my equity in my company, just giving it over to people um, with that in mind that if I were to leave, I want to be sure that the company will have a strong team that can continue to manage the company and, and see that it, it maybe will survive. But I hope it never gets to that point. Jeannie and I will be, we would love to stay in China for mm-hmm. the rest of our lives. Um, if that does not happen, we've traveled to 100 countries. We, are, we know what's out, what awaits us outside. And it will just be another part of our adventure, our life adventure. Mm. Hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Yes. <laughs> but I bet you won't, uh, things won't get that bad. I, I don't think so. I, I have confidence in this country. Then what's your plan for the next decade in this country? We'd like to continue to grow a bit. Sure. And we do hope we can return to those pre-COVID days where we're doing more you know, social programs, cultural programs, more exchange. And I would love, I'm honored to be a part today of your, you know, be taking part in your, in your program. I'd love to continue to share another voice and add that voice into, into the, um, what people are hearing about both sides. Um, I think my views of China are pretty balanced. And I think that, um, that I hope people will see a, a, a softer American as well. You know, somebody here who is here because out of respect. Sure. We are actually seeing that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, you're scheduled to speak at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. So what messages are you trying to communicate? Often what I will tell the, um, what I'd like to share with my friends at the embassy is really just the reality of, um, of our business model in China, you know, in rural China and our efforts and our so the support we are getting both from the Chinese people and the Chinese government. So I feel that they need to hear this. Um, it's a different experience from maybe what larger companies have here in maybe in Beijing or Shanghai, of course. And because of our size, maybe it's not as important, but it still is valid. It still is real. You can't say, you know, so I feel that somehow they have to know this. Our, we're partners with the Chinese government in, in all, on all our projects. Mm. I have v- nothing to complain about. And I find our opportunities are only growing. So I, need, I want to share this with them to, for, so they realize that maybe they're, so that they get a, a lot of information. Mm. They see that there are Americans doing some really cool things here in China. Mm. You think that's important because? I want them to have a full understanding of what is possible here in China. If they feel that all they, if all they ever hear is negative feedback about challenging policies or something, um, I think that at least I can offer one, one example of maybe something a little more positive. Um, and um, yeah, so that's why I do this. Also, I believe that we're a wonderful platform for promoting more cultural exchange between mm-hmm. our countries. We are very proud to share American culture wherever we go. And um, I'm also very proud to share China's culture with, with um, the American audience. Wish you every success in your mission here in China. Thank, Thank you. you for talking to us, Brian. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was Brian Linden, founder of the Linden Center, a chain of boutique hotels converted from historic buildings in rural China, talking about his legendary experience in the country, in particular, 
how an American realized his Chinese dream through involvement in the country's rural and cultural development over the past few decades. If you have any comments on his story or on the show, please feel free to leave a review for us. You can find us on all major podcast platforms. Just search Chat Lounge. I'm Tuyun. Thank you for listening.